final mission. The only problems left were technical. Again, Jet Propulsion Lab's Norm Haynes. The thing that really caused us the most difficulty going on to Uranus and Neptune was the distance. And the distance causes two problems. First of all, you're further and further away from the sun, which makes things darker and darker. And so when we wanted to take pictures, the exposure times went up significantly. They went for have the townspeople, if they felt like it, send letters to these boys in, in a company over there that, and get the list of the names and Christmas time, and, and I'm looking for way ahead, but I, I've got an idea they'll be there. Uh, just a morale booster is what it is. Yeah, you'd be surprised what, what this will do for their morale. And, uh, and we thought it was a great idea, and I, I just want to, because we're going to publicize it, we'd like to get it out to the nation, really, because uh, more, more towns, more states, and everybody else will pick up on it, I'm sure. That's the only thing I'm after right now is just a, whether it's a good thing to do uh, or not by the council so we can use the town of Cape Elizabeth names what we're after. So you're not really asking us to do any kind of organization or forwarding? No. You're basically, you're going to advertise no, we're, we're, how? We would uh, put this in the Cape Courier and uh, give the name of the company. We would correspond with uh, the CO of that particular company and we've already recommended that we use a company that we have one of our hometown boys in now. And that would be uh, Barbara Sanborn's son is currently serving in the Gulf with, uh, with one of the Marine units over there. Comments from counselors? Madam Chairman. McLaughlin. Jim, I did see that a comment about this in the minutes from your last meeting. I'm glad you're here tonight to discuss it with us. I will speak only for myself, but I'm will be in favor of supporting this as a counselor. I think it's a great idea. I know when I wrote to friends of mine during the Vietnam conflict and what they could later tell me about that, and I at that point was teaching a fourth grade class and had them write to my friends unit and it was much appreciated. Um, they shared some good jokes and things like that and I think it's a very good idea and I commend you for coming up with it. Councilor Jordan. I second what Councilman Goffin said. I think it's a great idea, and I hope you'll move forward with it. Good. Councilor Crumman. I would ditto and also suggest you send along the, uh, the Cape Couriers as much as possible, keeping them informed of what is happening here. Great it's idea. A, I think it's a superb uh, idea. Councilor Amaro. Yeah, I'm just happy to see that you went beyond the charge of your committee. <laughs> <laughs> And when something this appropriate came along uh, uh, to recommend doing it, and I've been watching uh, on the Today Show every morning uh, as uh, some of the uh, soldiers uh, over there in the desert uh, are sending greetings at home, and the one thing they always say is, please send mail. Right. <laughs> so I think right. it's a great idea also. Councilor Pearson. Ditto along with me. <laughs> Councilor Reed, I think we have a unanimous consensus that it's an excellent idea and we um, support your idea. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other citizens who wish to make a comment not on the agenda? If not, we'll move on to the next item, which is reports and correspondence. I have here um, a letter from Jane Cronin. Um, but she also wishes us to plan, uh, pass on to the school board, just saying, in effect, that um, she was concerned about the disruption of the beginning of school and wished there could have been a more appropriate notice. And we also have a letter from Mr. Charles J. McCarthy of Stony Brook Road, um, also talking about um, the school and town program problems and um, how the money should be appropriately handled. This would also be forwarded, and we'll discuss it at our workshop meeting. Just one brief announcement about um, Coast Week 90, September 29th through October 6th, that the two lights in Crescent Beach State Parks and Crescent Beach State Park are going to have cleanup days. They're going to meet at 10 p.m. at the different um, parks 10 to 2. There are contact numbers uh, if you wish to volunteer and I think we can 
have those numbers available at the town office if you're interested in, in helping. Next on the agenda <coughs> is the recognition of a petition from a group of citizens in reference to the special deer deprivation um, program that's being conducted in the town of Cape Elizabeth along with numerous correspondence from people from all over the state. Um, we did receive the petition in the town hall in time to be placed in our packets. Is Ms. Moore here? Would you like to come forward and just give us a brief statement as to your petition? Well, first of all, on the petition, there's a couple um, things I'd like to change where it says town officials. It should read town employees because it was a town employee who answered the phone and misled us. Um, on the first, first <coughs> reason I wanted this. Okay. And then in reason number six, I used um, the town council members based the final decision on outdated information, which it should have read out on outdated statistical information. I basically what I'm asking is um, for you to reconsider and reopen a public hearing on this decision um, for the reasons listed on the petition. I feel that um, more research should be done as a courtesy to us taxpayers. We, we feel we, we didn't have enough to go with. Um, as myself as a taxpayer and as I was getting signatures and working on this, we we didn't have any say um, on deer control. If there, there needed to be some, which we'll, I'm agreeing there does, but not necessarily having a bag limit at three. Um, I don't feel the police department's qualified to monitor this from their regular routine. I don't see how they can see what's going on in the woods. It's, there's no way. Just it, from what I understand, they'll be driving the roads and monitoring it. How can they see? what's happening. I'm just asking to reconsider, reopen. It may not change anything. I'm hoping it would, but if you'd kindly just reopen the public hearing and take a further look into this. Okay, the, the usual procedure is, is to have a, a town council member who voted in the affirmative mm -hmm. move to reconsider their vote. Mm -hmm. That's what and I'm it would be more of a discussion of our vote and not necessarily a whole new public hearing if we decided to do so. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to thank you. Um, I know this was probably this was your first experience because we had a long telephone conversation mm -hmm. about just creating a petition, mm -hmm. and I think that alone is a good educational experience and certainly exemplifies the democratic process in in making the effort to um, produce this um, petition and spend all the time gathering the signatures. So I do rec we do recognize your acceptance. However, there, I do want to make a statement um, about this issue. And I, too, would like to be able to correct some things that are in your petition. Mm -hmm. All right, because I have a feeling that um, through the press or whatever, there has been a misconception as to what the whole, our whole uh, role was in this particular process. Um, as far as you're saying that the, the um, Taxpayers at Cape Elizabeth were not notified. Um, we did have public hearing notice over a month before we even held the public hearing. It, there were at least three different extensive articles in the newspaper. And that um, I also wanted you to know that all the hunting regulations are set by the state, at the state legislature. And we would have absolutely no say over this whole affair if the police weren't asked to monitor it. Monitor it. Um, that the state legislature really is the proper forum to um, repeal bow hunting as a practice in the state. That we have no say over it, that it has been going on for years. It's part of the normal hunting practice throughout the state. It is not an extended hunting period. It's the usual two month period that exists throughout the state. Okay. I'm not against bow hunting no, at all. No, but I'm just saying that I'm trying to clarify a lot of the misstatements that have been made through this whole, this whole process. Um, 
I also feel that um, this depredation program has been going on in Cape Elizabeth for at least 15 years. That the farmers, in order to get the special permits, have to prove to the state that there has been extensive, extensive financial damage before it can be issued. Um, and that the state hunting laws supersede most local ordinances. So there again, we are somewhat um, unable to, to regulate hunting, per se. Um, there was a statement in here that uh, the 50 invitees would not have to take a proficiency test. They mm -hmm. would have to take it if they wanted to have the three deer limit. Otherwise, they were the regular invitees who had been involved in the program over the years. I believe the proficiency test and part of the education program was held this Sunday. And of the place she gave us the latest information, there were over 100. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, there were 100 and original 176 applicants, only 89 who showed up passed the test. They eliminated 67. So that alone is a, a very positive um, criteria that, that they do have to pass this test. Um, that the test that is being conducted is, is only in certain wooded areas on the property of these four or five farmers. They, the hunters have no right to trespass on anyone else's property at all. Oh. In my mind, this, this uh, special program has only been approved for one year. And we as a council are going to ask the ch police chief to submit a report, probably by the January 18, 1991, to give us all the, um, how effective it was, whether how cost effective it was, how expensive, and the amount of time that it took to, if it really is, was a beneficial program at all. So this is not an open-ended program, it does not have open-ended approval. Um, that, and I just want to repeat again that the proper forum for bow hunting as being legal or not is it with your state legislators and that the local representatives, Mary Webster and Senator Barbara Gill would be the ones to contact on this particular item. Are there any comments from counselors on this issue? Is there any any uh, one who wants to reconsider their vote? There being none, then the item is closed. I thank you for your petition. Is there any other reports and correspondence people would like to bring forth? Councilor Amaro. Uh, yes, I had uh, a letter from uh, Michael Crowley of Birchwood Road. Uh, expressing his concerns about the problems experienced with uh, the school system over the past few weeks, uh, highlighting several items of, of concern and then offering several suggestions. And I, I'd like to add this to uh, other communications to be considered with, at the school board, with the school board on Wednesday night. Okay. Okay. We'll, we'll copy these for the council, try to get them to you between now and uh, any item of other reports and correspondence? There being none, we'll move on to the next item, which is the public hearing for the uh, bicycle ordinance. Um, Councilor McLaughlin, as chairman of the ordinance committee, would you like to give us some background, please? Thank you, Madam Chair. The ordinance committee has looked at a number of ordinances so far this year. This is one where I cannot say that we have unanimous agreement on the committee which always makes it more interesting. Why are you looking at me? He's going to hit me again. <laughs> um, in reviewing the existing bicycle ordinance, we found that there were some parts of it that currently are not being enforced. And I think the basic question we need to deal with is if we're going to keep the existing language, are we going to expect our police officers, our police department to enforce this ordinance if we're not is it better to strike the ordinance and have there be a policy regarding the use of bicycles in Cape Elizabeth? And we did at our last meeting ask the manager to compare the town ordinance with the state ordinance. He has done that for us and provided some of the comparisons showing that in a number of cases, um, parts of our ordinance do duplicate the state ordinance and therefore if we wanted to strike those parts from our ordinance, we could do so and have the state ordinance take precedence. 
Thank you. Is there anyone from the public who wishes to step forth and make a comment on the bicycle ordinance? Yes, please. Would you come to the podium and give us your name and address, please? <laughs> My name is Guy Fifield, and I live at 38 Concord Place. Uh, I simply had a question. I'm not familiar with the bicycle ordinance, but I would like to be because I live just off from Mitchell Road, and believe me, there is quite a problem with bicycles and joggers. Uh, but particularly bicycles because they're a little harder to control than your own two feet. And uh, so if anyone could uh, briefly explain to me what the bicycle ordinance is, I would appreciate it uh, because I am concerned not only uh, about bicycles on Mitchell Road, but for anyone who travels Route 77, and I guess that's just about everyone. And uh, also I think it's Pleasant Hills Road off from 77 to take the shortcut over to Scarborough. Uh, all of these roads that I've mentioned are so narrow that uh, I'm surprised that we haven't had uh, cyclists killed. And uh, it's, I, I consider it quite a matter of concern, so I just wondered what the ordinance is. Does it have anything to do with these narrow roads or, or what? Uh, I'll tell you some of the highlights and lowlights. <laughs> I don't mean to slow down the meeting, but uh, I'm not yeah, familiar with the ordinance. I think you're asking a question that a lot of other people have in their minds, actually. Um, the, the first few sections talk about the requirement to license bicycles, that no bicycle shall be ridden unless it's been licensed. Okay, but that's one of the things we don't. I was going to say, excuse me, I was going to say, I've got an extra copy, which oh, if he wants you. to look through that while we're okay. having any discussion, yeah. and then if you have questions okay. behind that, that's down and, uh, I thank you very much. I think one of the safety items that may be in your mind, I know it's in a number of people's minds, is the fact that we do sometimes encounter bicyclists who are riding abreast, who are riding two together instead of one in front of the other. That happens quite often, yes. And I've been actually seeing more of that lately, but... I've got a good horn in my car, and that seems to straighten them out so they ride one, one in front of the other. That is part of our current ordinance, that no person shall operate a bicycle abreast or beside any part of another bicycle upon any public way except while passing another bicycle. Is there anyone else? Would you come forward, please, and give us your name and address? Excuse my cold. Uh, Brent Backman, 58 Old Colony Lane. Um, I just want to say that um, I've been all over this country, um, pretty much east of the Mississippi and a few states west of the Mississippi. I really want to commend you guys for having very good uh, road conditions in Cape, because um, there are many places I've been that um, the the only road there is is a dirt road, uh, two ruts, and uh, when it comes to a farm tractor or a bicycle, uh, usually the bicycle loses. Um, either there they go off in a cornfield somewhere or off in the woods. Um, around here, uh, I've noticed that there are many uh, bike routes, and uh, they are very well maintained, uh, especially compared to. Um, a lot of other places across the country. I really want to commend you guys for doing a very good job. Thank you. Any other comments? <laughs> there being none, I'll close the public part of the hearing and the board will deal with item number 59. <clears throat> no, excuse me, 58. Um, whether or not to continue the bicycle ordinance in Cape Elizabeth. Discussion from members of the council. Council Lee. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, I checked with the police department regarding the number of accidents along Route 77 and Shore Road for the past 24 months. There have been two, uh, one uh, involved property damage and one involved bodily injury. And as we readdress, uh, re uh, think the bike uh, bicycle ordinance, I would also like to take this uh, time to ask the people who are driving cars in Cape Elizabeth to please uh, watch out for the bikers as well as pedestrians. Thank you. 
other comments from counselors? Councilor Jordan. Thank you. As a member of the Ordinance Committee, and I sit in on one session on this, and I didn't sit in on the last one because I happen to be busy, but I'm opposed to dumping the whole ordinance because I think there's parts of it that is worth keeping. And uh, the bi there's getting to be more bicycles out there on the road today, and I think it's time to, to grab the bull by the horns and have an ordinance and let these bikers know that uh, there's some rules and regulations in Cape Elizabeth anyway, as far as where you ride. They're about ready to take the road over. And uh, whether you believe it or not, uh, I see it quite a lot because I travel the roads here quite a lot. And they go two abreast, and you've got to go around them. They're not going to move for you unless you want to bump them off the road. And I think I'd be guilty of something else after that. So I'm not in favor of dumping the ordinance. I'll guess that in five years, somebody gets hurt on the road, they'll be back here wanting to enact an ordinance to uh, control the bikers in the Cape. That's why I'm opposed to it. Councilor Amaro. Uh, I feel very similar to Bill in that I think that we don't have to duplicate in our ordinance uh, the state regulations. Uh, we can maybe have an ordinance which references the state regulations, but which adds to that, particularly the areas that which we always felt important here, uh, disallowing riding abreast. I think that's really key on the narrow roads that we have in Cape Elizabeth. Uh, I don't see any need to have to register bicycles or anything to that effect. However, I do think it's important uh, in a community that encourages people uh, to uh, ride their bikes and to jog and to share the streets with automobiles that we ought to have an, an ordinance that uh, uh, specifies some of uh, uh, what we feel are safety precautions. Councilor Creelman. I'm on the Ordinance Committee uh, also with uh, Councillor McLaughlin and uh, Jordan. And the real question we, we grappled with was how much duplication is there in the current bicycle ordinance that also is fairly set forth in state statutes. And, and that's why we have the, the frontispiece here with respect to the major safety issues that we felt were the most important uh, of the bicycle ordinance areas. Um, the, uh, the basic uh, thrust of the recommendation was that the bicycle issues uh, should be handled uh, by the police department from the uh, perspective of a public safety, uh, public service perspective. Uh, instead of a law enforcement uh, perspective, we have an ordinance that simply uh, isn't being enforced. Um, all bicycles are not being licensed. And our thought was that bicycle licenses should be encouraged and provided uh, as a free service in the community. Uh, and that was why we, uh, or at least my understanding was that the majority of the committee recommended that the uh, ordinance be repealed given the duplication in state statutes and uh, our hope that we could switch the focus from uh, law enforcement to public safety. And that's why I intend to vote for the repeal of the ordinance as uh, currently stated. Councilman McLaughlin. I would like to point out that the penalties that are currently listed in the existing ordinance this is one of my concerns that with this kind of penalty, I'm not sure it's the kind of penalty that I want to see taking place in our town. It says when the police, when the chief of police is satisfied that any person has operated, rented, or offered for rent a bicycle in violation of any of the provisions in sections 1, 6, or 8 of this ordinance, and that refers to licensing, rentals, and riding abreast. <laughs> He shall issue a written warning to such person for the first offense during any single licensing period, which is annually. He may impound the bicycle for a period not to exceed five days for a second offense, and for a period not to exceed 20 days for any subsequent offense during any single licensing period. 
I have a hard time thinking we're going to be impounding bicycles. And that's at least one part of the ordinance that I want repealed, even if we keep other parts of it. I would still favor repealing the entire ordinance, but I think that penalty section is unrealistic. One of my big concerns with, Councilor Jordan, go ahead. No, I just want to say that uh, it isn't a requirement that he uh, impounds that bicycle. It says he may impound the bicycle. So he has a choice there. He doesn't really. The copy that I got here, anyway, if I read it correctly, says he may impound the bicycle for the period not to exceed five days. And uh, so I think there is some, to me, there is some merit here. And they always want some teeth to do other things. And uh, I would think they would need something more than a policy. Now, as far as registering bicycles, I'm, I'm not hepped up on requiring registering, but I would think anybody who owned a bicycle would want to register it in case it was stolen. Somebody would have some information on where the bike owned it. And if it was found, they would, could find the owner if it was registered. So I would think that uh, anybody would want to register a bicycle, get the serial number with it the police department or somewhere else, so if they pick up a bike, they can find out who owned it. To me, it's good common sense, but that don't go very far some days. But that, that um, service would still be offered, even though That's it wasn't right. part of the... I guess one of my biggest concerns with both the local ordinance and the state ordinance relates back to all the safety factors we've discussed. And one of the most important safety factors that has been neglected by both the state and local officials is the fact that bicycles are supposed to have headlamps or lights if they're operating at night. And that's not being enforced anywhere, and that is a serious safety issue. Yes, they may have reflectors on the, on the wheels, and yes, they may have reflectors on the seats, but there are some nights when you come up on it in the fog, it's almost too late. So I think it, that um, even if we do repeal the local ordinance, that some consideration has to be done with um, at least educating the public, if not enforcing the light requirement. Other comments? Councilor Pearson. I was just going to say, uh, Madam Chairwoman, that uh, I almost added to the statistics that Rosemary cited when I was coming out of Surf Road last week, and three young ladies were coming on the wrong side of Shore Road, turning into Surf Road, two of them just missing the front of my vehicle, the third one actually weeble wobbling hitting a knee on the front of the car, and just continue to riding on uh, rampant fashion. And I think that the, uh, you know, the local ordinance as far as the licensing uh, I think is uh, ludicrous to try to enforce. I agree with uh, Councilor Jordan that anyone with sense that has a bike should register it in the event that it's stolen. And I also concur with uh, Councilor Creelman that it should be a public safety issue and I think that at the beginning of school year and perhaps at the end as we're heading into the summer season when kids are more apt to be riding their bikes, that uh, a member of the police department should go to the schools and offer a free educational seminar and also have information available on state laws available to bikers that choose to uh, pedal through the streets of Cape Elizabeth. There are no further comments. Um, I'd like to take a motion. On this item. Madam yes. Chairman, I would move that the bicycle ordinance be repealed. Second. Any further discussion? Councilor Reed. Uh, Madam Chairman, I just have a question. If we repeal the or ordinance uh, tonight, do we leave open the opportunity to put in its place one that is more effective and enforceable if we see uh, necessary in the next couple of months? Would not the state law supersede anyway? If that's in effect, then we would. Or well, the, the, the one issue that, that particularly doesn't seem to be in this, this state ordinance that I've had some concern about is riding abreast. If, in fact, the council does repeal this this evening, uh, you know, what I'd probably do is submit back to the council a proposal to take the riding abreast provision and put it under the miscellaneous <coughs> offenses section of, of the town ordinances. Uh, which would be a section that would have more teeth as far as enforcement uh, than the bicycle ordinance now does. It, it actually has a fine, uh, you know, that would be uh, assessed by uh, a court. One of the problems with the, the bicycle confiscation provision is it, it puts the, the police chief into the position of, uh, 
being law enforcer, prosecutor, judge, and jury. And, uh, you know, it's a, not a very good position uh, for any one individual to be in. Councilman McLaughlin. Madam Chairman, I'm wondering if the section in the state ordinance, section 1962, equipment, with the description of a bikes used in the nighttime shall have a lighted lamp at the front, if that addresses your concern. Is that what you were referring to? Yes, but I'm saying it's required in both the local and state ordinances, okay. but it's not enforced. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. It being no further, uh, Councilor Jordan. I, I just want to say that I'm going to vote in the negative on this because I can't see dumping the ordinance and then turn around and rewrite a new one and you have something here. And on top of that is if they're supposed to have lights at night and a lamp and what have you and you've got it in the state and we have it here and nobody's enforcing it, why bother to do anything? Councilor Amaro. I'm also going to vote against it because I'd rather see us, rather than just dumping the whole ordinance, uh, I'd rather see the ordinance committee uh, reconsider, after the comments they've heard tonight, uh, eliminate the areas that they think are just plain duplications of the state, but maybe highlight some areas that are really important to Cape Elizabeth and safety in Cape Elizabeth. And I think an ordinance is one way of highlighting uh, safety issues. I agree with what everybody said, that safety is what, what we're all talking about. Uh, and I think by just dumping this whole ordinance, uh, we're pretty much saying, well, let's let the state uh, state laws override, but we're not going to highlight the, it, this issue in Cape Elizabeth. No other comments? I'll move the motion. <coughs> all those in favor of eliminating the bicycle ordinance and having the manager refer back to the ordinance committee a inclusion of riding abreast under misdemeanors. Was that? That wasn't part of it. It wasn't part. That was the intent. Okay. All those in favor of eliminating the bicycle ordinance. Those opposed. Okay, four, three. It loses. Next item on the agenda. Madam Chairman, yes. we have direct, would the Ordinance Committee have direction from the rest of the Council? Is there consensus with James, Council Amaro's suggestion? Yes. Good. That's what you Thank want you. To, yes. <laughs> the direction, I guess, in addition to the riding of rest, is there anything else that you want to include? You just want us to read, Council Pearson. Uh, I was going to say, Madam Chair, that Perhaps if we might just uh, have the ordinance committee work with, maybe just come up with uh, a list of what we feel, just sort of a uh, conglomerate of ideas from everything discussed here tonight, and not necessarily put it back to the drawing board and say refine it, but work on something that works with uh, Chief Pickering and his department, something that they feel they could incorporate in a public safety type uh, informational format but keep it on the book so that, you know, we're not duplicating something that's already there. So I don't know if that gives direction to the ordinance committee to perhaps be open to suggestions and we'll put them your way and then at a later date bring it up when the agenda's not real busy. How's Optimist. That? <laughs> <laughs> Which meeting was that? Yeah. Thank you. Councilor Reid, you had your hand up. Uh, yes, Madam Chairman, I have two points. Um, Again, on safety, and the first is that all brakes uh, be in working order and that the bicycle be suitable for operation. And also the safety issue that bikers are not allowed to uh, exceed the posted speed limit uh, if that is, in fact, the case. Some bikers do go. Speed Nor limit. ride against traffic. Or ride against just traffic. Just supposed to observe the rules of the road yes. for all vehicles. Right? I just thought if that were highlighted that might be worthwhile. Any other guidance to the ordinance committee? If not, we'll move on to the next okay. item, which is a public hearing on the town purchasing uh, of 1226 Shore Road. Um, one of the, I'll just give a little background first. This parcel of land um, abuts the town, um, town hall. 150 feet of it abuts our back lot. 
is 180 feet of frontage on Shore Road. The combined parcel of the Jones House along with our uh, 1.75 acres would give us 3.25 acres of town-owned land in the center of town. Most of the land in town um, is privately owned and is not, has not and may not come uh, available for purchase. One of the um, goals of the comprehensive plan is to try to um, either have the right of first refusal uh, on one or more of remaining residences or areas that abut the town. We're in trying to develop the concept of a town center. Um, this is also very important, sort of a sense of the town. That we have a community service program and other um, town offices that are currently have space needs during the daytime and meeting time uh, in the evening for um, special classes or for town committee uh, meetings. That um, there is a very level pass from the back, our back lot, to the Jones property, which make, would make an easy, um, handicap accessible uh, facility. And there are a number of large rooms that are available, and with minor modification, it could be, all the rooms could be handicap accessible, including the bathroom. Uh, one of our priority, moderate priority goals is to develop a senior citizen center, and this Jones property might be um, incorporated for that particular type of use. However, I do want to stress that no one use is being considered in the purchase of this property, that we are open to a lot of suggestions and we're going to do a lot of study before we make any commitment for one program other for another. But it would be an expansion of town facilities that could be used by uh, the town. Town meaning school and municipal sides. But this is in an RA zone, which is um, zone for um, municipal use as well as for residential use. Um, we have on our bulletin board pictures of the exterior as well as the, some of the interior rooms. There are statistics as to the, it's a 22,000 square foot house. Um, it has been on the market since November of last year. And it was only within the past month or so that the town has decided, yes? 2,200. 2,200 square foot. Thousand. Hundred. 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 Excuse me. Oh. Quite, quite a we, lot. We, do, we do need municipal <laughs> facilities, yes. Um, so the... I guess that is basically it, and this is the public hearing, so any of you would like to come forward and make a comment. We have the real estate broker here, Alice Rand, who uh, possibly could um, add any extra information that we feel we need. No one wishes to come forward to make a comment? Would you please? My name is Lynn Lovett and I live at 31 Broad Cove Road. Um, I came here to speak on another issue tonight and was too late for the earlier public hearing, but this also interests me. Um, I'm the mother of two and almost three teenagers and I was under the understanding that this was only going to be considered as a senior citizen center, which I think is a wonderful idea. Um, but also our kids need a place to go in the evening. And I am a child of the 60s and grew up having mixers on Saturday nights in church halls and things like that. And think that this would be a great place, if possible, to have a place for our teenagers to go instead of Kettle Cove and Kremlin Farms and Lions Field and all the places there going to hang out together and getting chased out of by the police. So possibly this is a solution to that problem as, to, as well as to the needs of the senior citizens. Thank you. Good comment. Um, please come forward if you want to, if there are enough people who want to make a comment, you could stand along the edge. This gentleman right here, in the second row, had his hand up. Yes, thank you. The only comment that I have to make is a very basic one. Can we afford to buy this property? Um, but the reason I ask is that we've had some problems uh, with the school, one of the schools where we've had a series of mishaps, shall I call them, 
which probably are going to be proved to be quite expensive uh, during the coming year. And uh, with this uh, purchase being contemplated, I just wondered, uh, are the bucks all there? Because we had a substantial increase in our tax rate this year. I, my bill alone went up $200, which I consider quite substantial. So I do wonder what effect all of these projects are going to have on our taxes for this, not this current fiscal year, but the next one. Um, Do you want to answer that, Michael? Yeah, it, Does anyone have any idea? Yes, we have. Yeah. It's all written out. Yeah, whether or not it, it could be afforded, you know, is a council judgment or a public judgment. The actual impact on the tax rate, including the balance needed to purchase, purchase the land, some money, some money that would need to go into some renovations as well as operating and maintenance costs is approximately uh, $30,000 uh, uh, per year for, for a 10-year period when the, per when the purchase would be amortized. Uh, that is approximately five cents on the tax rate out of a, out of a total tax rate of a little over uh, $15. Okay. And that would be for uh, the uh, year after purchase? Uh, That's correct. Yes. Well, uh, I am concerned about the tax rate. I think many people are, and uh, I'm, a, I'm a part uh, seasonal resident, and uh, I, I would much prefer to have uh, someone who's a year-round resident ask these questions, but since there's no one else here apparently to ask them, why I, it's the only way I can find out. And. <laughs> Uh, you've relieved me somewhat. <laughs> Councilor Amaro. I'd just like to add that uh, for the past three or four years now, the town has been setting aside each year a certain amount of money to go toward a land acquisition fund in case properties did become available, that we would have set aside some of that money so that it wouldn't come as a shock in any one uh, budget year. Uh, so we have been uh, planning on uh, being prepared when a property did become available either in the center of town or someplace else that we th deemed very valuable for, for, for the future of the town, that, that we would be ready uh, to purchase it and not burden the taxpayers in one given year at least anyway. Yes, well, uh, I appreciate your, uh, your answers and uh, uh, since I am a seasonal resident, why uh, I, I can't speak with uh, the uh, authority or uh, ask the, the perhaps more sensible questions that someone who has lived here for some time can, but I'm <laughs> trying to get in, uh, uh, find out whatever information I can, that's all. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to step forward? Yes, my name is Jerry Murray, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a resident of Monco. And I think it's a, a great gesture, and it's about time that we started looking at Pont Cove as, a, as, as what the town's needs are for the future. The town's growing everywhere but Pont Cove, and there's no more land available. And I think it's, uh, it's I think they missed the boat when they, they didn't consider or approach the Robinson family when they, when they uh, had subdivided the the state to the to the uh, south of us, and I think that uh, uh, any property that abuts the town is uh, extremely valuable. And I think in this location, I was surprised when I first heard about it. But then after you're looking at it, you say, say you know, uh, it, it, it has some real, real good merits. And uh, and uh, I'm I'm all in favor. I, I I also own several parcels in Pont Cove, and and I think the town. Uh, Deserves, deserves some of these passes. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wishes to step forward? I'm Sue Weatherby and I speak as the Director of Community Services. And as Director, I'm not impartial on this issue. I think there is a great need for such a facility in Cape Elizabeth. I have some data that supports that a need does truly exist. Annually, community services strives to keep pace with the demographic trends and continue to provide community programs for all its citizens. 
the demographics are changing in Cape Elizabeth and there are going to be more older adults in the 90s, many of these folks looking for more daytime activities. Last year, our enrollments and our programs exceeded 8,000, 4,100 of which were adults. We increased our daytime programming programs to 29. All 29 had sufficient enrollment, many reaching max maximum numbers. With this kind of success, I think it makes sense to offer more daytime programming. We're presently utilizing space in Town Hall, the Bowery Beach Schoolhouse, the local churches, the Public Safety Building, the Thomas Memorial Library, and space really um, prevents us from expanding these offerings any further. So I think this would be a great opportunity for us to reach out and, and meet that need for the population in our community who perhaps does not have children in schools. Community Services also sponsors bi-monthly senior citizen programs. Right now we're meeting in the high school, which certainly prevents us from meeting as often as we'd like, and it also dictates the times that we're able to meet. Our Senior Citizen Club is open to all members of Cape Elizabeth. Um, we also have some folks that um, attend that don't live in the community. Um, and these people are looking for more programs during the day. Most of them yearn to go to a place that they can meet people just like them. And I think it's time for us to reach out and, and meet the needs of that population in our community. Thank you. Any other comments from the public? If not, I'll close that part of the public hearing. We'll move on to consideration of um, item number 59 on the purchase and potential uses of 1226 Shore Road and take any necessary action. I also want to say that we have a letter from Henry Adams, who is the chairman of the Town Center Concept Committee, which is a subcommittee of Main Street 90, who is strongly in favor of have, our having enough um, foresight to try to purchase this particular piece of property and others in the Town Center. Discussion from Council Members. Council Creeman. Well, as the, uh, the finance chairman of the council this year, I, I hope I won't live to regret spending money. Uh, but I just think that this particular purchase uh, is a purchase that we can't uh, resist at this time. Uh, I don't think it's a, an appropriate metaphor, but I think we were in this position uh, not long ago when Fort Williams was for sale. And I think if you wonder about what would have happened if Fort Williams had gotten chopped up you know, into condominiums or something, and we would have lost that. It would have been a real tragedy for the town. The uh, census, at least the estimated census, looks like we have about 8,829 people in Cape Elizabeth, although everyone's disputing the figures throughout the country. But if that's roughly accurate, we've gained about 1,000 people or so uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, we need room for these people to go. I think Sue Weatherby, Weatherby's concerns, community services-wise, uh, it's a tremendous facility to use there. And I think from the senior citizen perspective, it's a beautiful home with, uh, with very minimal uh, construction. The entire place can be very handicapped uh, accessible, and I think that's uh, an important factor, too, since a lot of structures uh, with the whole process of revamping for uh, handicapped entry uh, can run into thousands of dollars very, very quickly. So I feel very, very strongly about uh, this purchase and uh, certainly will support its uh, purchase. Other comments? I think there's one thing I want to emphasize that um, as appealing as it is for just a senior citizen um, center, we are considering it for multiple uses and other uses that no real decision has been made as yet to um, the specific uses. We are just sort of considering lots of possibilities. Council Pearson. I just wanted to make uh, a couple points. One to uh, Mr. Fifield that uh, your concerns about other activities that have happened or occurred with other town properties. Uh, we have gone through full inspection uh, processes with home inspectors, uh, asbestos uh, inspectors, almost to the point where there's almost too many inspections. But we've been accused of having too many, but we haven't regretted it. So we have taken care of that. And as far as your seasonal stay here, the property looks nicer in the summer than it would in the winter. So you'll <laughs> probably enjoy that quite a bit. Um, and then to uh, 
Lynn Lovett. Uh, great comment, and I think that the whole property should be perceived as a community center, not a senior center, not a uh, community services, but a community center to benefit everyone. Thank you. Councilor Jordan. I just want to say that I reviewed the property, and I'm very much in favor of purchasing it. But I have had some calls, and the calls that I've got is concerned taxpayers on spending the money. And uh, this concerns me, and I think the mostly because the people called due to what's happened in the last few weeks within the town, and I think it's a damn shame, and I just hope we can correct it. And, and I have some comments when we meet with the school board about getting on track and, and see if we can't save some money out of there. Uh, there's only one thing that I'm not in favor of is the way the memo is put together here is that uh, we have a $200,000 that we set aside to purchase something. Now as I see the suggested memo, you only want to use 100000 of it and you want to bond 125000 now, I thought the purpose of setting that money aside to purchase it was to purchase land and not just purchase part of it that went out of that fund and then turn around and bond the rest. Uh, I'm really not in favor of that part of it. I think if we're going to purchase it, we should purchase it out of the account that we set aside to do that job and uh, go at it in that direction. Maybe you feel that you won't have any money left next year when you want to put the budget together because I'll be there to vote against it. I don't know. But, so you don't want to spend it all at this time. Thank you. Any other comments? If not, I'll take a motion. But Jack, excuse me, I have to follow up. Yes. I did tour this property last week. I had a, the fun privilege, actually, I'll say, of touring it with the community services staff who's, and I said this to them, I can say it publicly now, I said their eyes lit up like it was Christmas morning when they got in that building. And I will say they were very cognizant of the fact that a choice has not been made for the ultimate use of this building. We did discuss appropriateness or not of having it be used for our senior citizens, the appropriateness of it being used for our teenagers. Um, I have children this age is similar to Lynn Lovett's, one comment from my kids was, well, what adults are going to be there if we go? <laughs> and I think that's something we'll all expect. It's an appropriate use for us to look at, and that is something I can say to you that we will be looking at, not just having it be used for seniors, if that's one of the uses. I think one of the good advantages of this building is that it's not the institutional presence that we would have somewhere, say, at Fort Williams. It's an easy building to love because it is a home. It has that appearance, and that is the appearance the town will keep for this building. Is, I'll speak for myself, but I'll say that hopefully the town will keep for this building. One thing that has been mentioned, appearance-wise, and I've had a comment from a citizen today about the appearance of the abutting lot. And from my design experience, I say one way to deal with that is to make this the place where your eye goes rather than to the abutting lot. If there's no way for the town to screen with shrubbery or anything in the right of way, then this can become a focal point that will grab your eye rather than where it goes right now. And we know what your concern is. I did want to address that. I feel we are being fiscally responsible in, in the proposal I have seen for the money aspect of this, Councillor Jordan. I think we have been as Council Amaral said, putting money aside on an annual basis. We've been looking at purchases like this long term, philosophically. Now we have a chance to act on that. I don't want to totally deplete that fund because if we have another good chance, I don't want to say that that other good chance would have to be totally bonded and have to go through some of the anguish and agony when we go to total bonding for something. So I'm quite comfortable with taking 100,000 of the existing fund to use and bonding the rest of it. Thank you. Other comments? I'll take a motion on this item. Madam Chairman. Councilor Amaro. I move that the town of Cape Elizabeth approve the purchase 
that the town council approve the purchase by the town of certain real property of David and Ann Jones located at 1226 Shore Road, Cape Elizabeth, Maine, and more particularly described in a deed recorded in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds in Book 6498, 6, page 226, pursuant to a contract for sale of real estate dated August 21st, 1990, together with the improvements and personal property described therein for the purchase price of $190,000 that the town manager, Michael K. McGovern, be authorized on behalf of the town to purchase said property, accept delivery of a warranty deed, and execute any and all documents on behalf of the town to consummate the transaction, provided that the town manager be satisfied that all conditions precedent in said contract have been met and there is good and sufficient title to the property, particularly with respect to the 20-foot easement of pertinent to said property. I'll second that motion <coughs> with one comment. What property was you concerned about? Which side of that property there you know? <laughs> the appearance? Yeah, the appearance. There's a lot of large equipment in one property this side. Equipment is, is something I take to look at. And one <laughs> I'm passing on a comment I had from a citizen this morning. Is there any further discussion on the motion? If not... Madam Chairman, yes. I do have a question. Are we approving how we are going to fund this that was not part of the motion is that assumed i what are you trying to get me to vote against <laughs> i want you to be I'm clear a nervous about for. expending 190,000 without the the council indicating where it's coming from i think the auditors will be looking for would you like uh, to amend that council amaro sure I, I would add that uh we purchased this uh through uh a hundred thousand dollars from the land acquisition front fund and $125,000 uh, from a bond, through a bond. Now, is there a second to that, Councillor Jordan? Can I qualify my second? <laughs> no, it's either yay or nay. <laughs> that adds up to more than 190000 I think okay. that does. That, but, that uh, also <laughs> includes the cost for the site work and the professional planning. Thank you. Did you want that in the motion, too? Just yes. a second. Yes. That isn't the way I see it in the paper yet. I haven't it. Are you amending the motion? I am. You don't have okay. to second the amendment. I don't have to second the amendment. Okay. Thank you. I'll second the amendment. And also, and I, you know, I knew you'd put me on the spot before the evening was over because I like the motion. When I first read it, I thought, well, that's a good motion. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank <laughs> Any further discussion? If not, if not, all those in favor of the motion. 7-0, unanimous. Very good. Next item on the agenda, item 44, which was postponed from our August uh, 13th meeting which is to consider granting a full-time malt, spiritus, and vinous license to Gray Bay Hotels, Incorporated, doing business as in by the sea and take any necessary action. Um, Mr. McGovern, would you like to give us the background on that, please? Yes. Update. The, yes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The Council last month had an extensive discussion uh, on this item and uh, ultimately tabled it. Did you take it off the table? Is there a motion to take it off the table? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? It's unanimous. And uh, <laughs> thank you. The uh, the specific question uh, that wanted that you wanted to have looked at was whether or not the provision on the uh, the application that provided that all records required to be kept under uh, the the particular legislative chapter were whether or not they were open uh, to the review of the municipal offices as well as to the Main State Liquor Commission. Uh, I spoke to Lynn Kaifid, who's the Director of Licensing for the Maine State Liquor Commission, and he indicated that it is his understanding that the uh, legislative intent was for the records to be open to the Maine uh, State Liquor Commission, but not to individual municipalities. Uh, there is also a, a specific reference, uh, tw uh, Title 28A, MRSA Section 755, which provides that all business and financial records of licensees are confidential, and he seemed to think that that uh, strengthened uh, his interpretation that uh, it was intended only to be open to the commission and not to municipalities and the public in general. Comments? 
Sounds good to me. There being a move we grant the license. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Unanimous. Madam Chairman, I'd just like to say one thing for you. I think these the people here that have these special cups and special water deals there ought to set them up on the table where people will think at home that we've got beakers on the council. And <laughs> they're always going down, filling the cup and setting it up here. I thought I missed your leg. <laughs> but for those at home, it's very hot under these lights, and the water in our thermoses becomes rather stale after a while. And there are certain councils who prefer to sip on iced tea and lemonade, and they provide their own thermoses. <laughs> And they re it really is just iced tea and lemonade. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've had comments about that too? Yes. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Number 60. To consider setting a public hearing on a citizen initiated petition to change the school board from five to seven members and take any necessary action. Uh, Mrs. Tizo, would you like to give us some information on that? Thank you. At the end of June, a five-member uh, petitioners committee, which is made up of five residents, got together. And what their goal was, was to gather enough signatures for a proposed amendment to the town charter to go before the residents of the community. Uh, according to state statute, the uh, petitioners committee had to gather 866 uh, registered voters of the town to put this proposed amendment uh, on the ballot for a vote. Specifically, what we're talking about is to increase the school board membership from five to seven, five to seven members. And what the committee is looking for um, are two positions to be voted for at the May 1991 municipal election. There would be one um, seat for a three-year term and one seat for a one-year term. This is trying to evenly distribute, if you will, the, um, the different terms, to stagger the terms more appropriately in the uh, school board. What the um, item is before the council tonight, the next step in this process is for the council to set a public hearing. Although there will not be a vote by the town council, by state statute, the council needs to provide a public forum for citizens to speak and comment on this proposed charter amendment. So we're asking for two uh, things tonight. Number one is for the council to set a public hearing, hopefully for the October 10th council meeting. And number two is the council needs to determine when this amendment, if passed by the voters of Cape Elizabeth, uh, when this amendment would take effect. It is the hope of the petitioners committee that the council would set the public hearing again for October, that it will be placed on the November general election ballot, and that it would be, if passed again, it would be effective at the May 1991 municipal election. I have provided the council with, um, I believe, the necessary information to set the public hearing tonight that does include the certification from myself, which states that the appropriate number of signatures were gathered and that they were certified through our Board of Voter Registration. Thank you, Mrs. Pisa. Is anyone from the, um, the special committee here that wants to make just a background statement on their petition, or are you satisfied with just having it set for public hearing? I think it would be basically. Do you want to just come forward and... and <laughs> My name is Diane Joyce. We uh, got the signatures, passed them in. We made our, our goal number. Now we're just waiting, I guess, for the meeting in October for public hearing. And then uh, hopefully we're on our way for November. And we're also hoping that in May, that that's when they can go in. When, when the election in May, that's, we can have that on that, that election to have two new ones. The new slots. Right. Okay. Is there any questions you have? No, I think not. Okay. Thank you, Great. Mrs. Joyce. Great. Councilor Jordan. I have, a, I have a question for Debbie Pizzo. Are we on target as far as uh, time schedule to be able to get this? Yes, we are, and this does coincide or it 
goes with the state statute as well as it works very nicely with our upcoming November election and the May uh, municipal election. Also. So if we set this for a public hearing on October the 10th at 730, do we have to wait until November or can we vote on it after the public hearing that evening? This is not a council vote. It is a vote um, of the registered voters in Cape Elizabeth. So it's not a council vote, so all we have to do is set it to a public hearing and agree to put it on the ballot. Is That's that, correct, that and you correct? also need to determine the effective date if this is passed in November, and, and hopefully it's the wish of the committee that it would be at the May, the upcoming May election. I'll move that we set this to a public hearing on Wednesday, October 10th at 7.30 p.m. the town hall. Second, but I do have a question. Council McLaughlin, this does not automatically go on the November ballot unless there is a council vote to do so. I'm seeing heads going both ways. The fact that the petitioners committee did receive enough certified signatures, it will go on the ballot. If there was not an upcoming election, that's when the council would have to determine a special election and so forth. But because of the timing, it, again, it worked out very nicely that we will be able to have it on as a special um, item, municipal item, on the November ballot. So people will be seeing this on the November ballot, regardless of what, is, what happens at the public hearing next month. That's we, correct. We have it next right. month. Thank you. Other comments? Councilor Amaro. Uh, yes. When, when will we decide uh, whether this would go into effect? In May or not. Is that after the vote is taken in November? I was hoping or it would we be in that as part of the motion. I was hoping it would be included in Councilor Jordan's motion. What was that? To have the effective date if this charter amendment um, is voted in by the people that it would be effective for the next May municipal election nineteen ninety one. Why I didn't catch it, I had something going around in my head because I can't understand why we shouldn't have to vote on putting it to November, just because we have an election going then, we don't have to vote on it. But if we didn't have an election going, then we have to vote to set a date. I just don't quite understand that part. But I'll add that to my motion. And I will second that. So amended. Yeah. Councillor, um, excuse me, Mr. McGovern. Keeps getting promoted. I, I think in response to uh, <laughs> Councillor Jordan's uh, question, when you as a municipal officer approve the warrant for the, for the election in November, you, you will have before you both the warrant for the state election as well as a, a warrant for the municipal uh, referendum vote. Okay, thank you. Councilor Emerald. Yeah, two things. First of all, I think that we should really publicize the fact that we will be holding this hearing on October 10th, that this isn't just going to be part of the normal town council meeting. I mean, this is really separate from any action that we'll be taking that night, so we should make an effort to publicize it. Uh, throughout the town. Also, I'd like to uh, compliment Diane Joyce, who just two months ago came before this council and wanted to know how she could go about uh, getting some interest in increasing the size of the school board and what a difference two months makes, because she has been out pounding the streets, uh, getting all of those signatures, and really to be complimented for a job well done. Thank you. Council Jordan. Don't you think what went on in the last month or two helped her? I think so. <laughs> it's very timely. <laughs> it's also timely in that there are a lot of other communities who have, um, for various reasons, expanded the membership on their school boards because of the sure. workload. Freeport's considering it, and there are several other communities that have just done it recently. So it's not just Cape Elizabeth. It seems to be a trend of the times as well. All those in favor of the motion as amended. 7-0. Set for public hearing and October 10th meeting. Item number 61, to consider a report from the planning board regarding a proposed ordinance amendment changing the time period for filing of variances, which was approved, a variance is approved by the planning board the Board of Zoning Appeals, excuse me, and take any necessary action. 
what this really is is just um, having our local ordinance meet the requirements of the state. Uh, the state originally required that within 30 days of granting of a variance, and it had to be registered in the Cumberland County Registry of Deeds. If they now give um, an appellant up to 90 days. Um, this has been forwarded to us from the planning board. It also had been through our ordinance committee, so it's more or less pro forma. So I'll take a motion on this item. So moved, Madam Chairman. Is there a second? Second. second. All those in favor of setting this for a public hearing in our October 10th meeting at 735? Oh, excuse me, 730, or else we have to put it separate in. Oh, it's have to say 730? Okay. We don't need a separate notice. I've learned. <laughs> Thank you very much. Item number 62. To consider the court decision remanding the FS plumber request to rezone certain lots in Eastfield subdivision and take any necessary action. Yes, Madam Chairman. Council Pearson. Um, I would like to uh, ask the council, excuse me, from participating in this mem uh, this item as there may be a perceived conflict uh, due to a previous employment with the company in question. Thanks. Is it unanimous the council will excuse Councilor Pearson from participating in this item? It is unanimous. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, really, this issue is more or less. What are your questions? I've <laughs> we'll give you. We'll give one opportunity for questions. This is not reopening a public hearing. It is not stating new information. It's based on everything that had gone before. It's just going through the basic process and having things itemized for the court. These questions relate directly to the point you just made. Paul Green. My name is Carl Westervelt from 33 Highview Road, and and the questions that I have first. Uh, the town recently passed a new comprehensive plan for which there were public hearings and all the studies again rated the Eastfield area, which is in question, as a wetland area to be protected. And uh, I, along with other residents in the area, then assumed that uh, any lawsuit that contests an RP zone becomes moot. And is, is this an issue that the council is, is planning to address, number one? And to discover that the judge uh, involved in this didn't have enough information from the town to support the town's decision is surprising, to say the least. Uh, we're also concerned about what was in, as you mentioned, what was in the Cape Elizabeth uh, file on the issue. And uh, uh, there's a, a number of documents that we understood to be in the file, and I won't list them all, but there were, th there were three comprehensive plans, town maps filed from uh, comprehensive plans showing the wetland area, uh, an engineering report from the town showing the, uh, so the soil and wetland area, uh, as unbuildable and et cetera. I won't, again, I won't continue. But those are, the, those are the key questions which we hope that you'll address this evening. Okay. We do have a record of the proceedings of the, of the lawsuit to start with. Great. Thank Plus, you. We also have our town attorney here who I believe would be <coughs> the one best to answer your question. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, for the benefit of, of the audience and perhaps those watching, this is a um, matter that's on remand from Superior Court. Um, it involves a matter presently in Superior Court. It's pending and certain aspects of the matter have been determined by the court. Other aspects or counts of this matter have not. Uh, in the course of the judicial proceeding, um, one of the several judges who has been involved in this case uh, reached the conclusion that he would like to have from this town council um, express findings of fact and conclusions of law in regard to your decision. Um, so you are absolutely correct. This is not, in our opinion, uh, an opportunity for another public hearing or a time for this council to take testimony or submissions uh, in regard to uh, deciding whether or not the council in 88 properly de decided this matter. What it decided was not to rezone these three lots in issue 
uh, from their then designation of resource protection to uh, residential as requested by uh, the applicants. There are actually two applicants, uh, Fred Plummer and F.S. Plummer. Um, so again, I want to emphasize that it's a limited matter that's presented to you now. Um, and what you have had presented to you are proposed findings of fact by our office as counsel to the town and by the counsel for uh, the applicants and now the appellants in the court proceeding. Um, if you will, both of these counsel have put together findings based upon uh, the record and uh, they are presented to you. Um, the, counsel, the counsel will note that the uh, one recites to be proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law, uh, re zone change request of FS Plumber Inc. et al. Those were the ones prepared by our law firm. The other expressly states, again, proposed findings, but it says submitted to the town by FS Plumber Inc. and Fred S. Plumber. That one has uh, additional exhibits. Um, basically, what I would ask the town council to do uh, would be to uh, assure itself that the members of the council who were not uh, present and participating in the earlier vote um, have reviewed the record submitted to them um, and are ready and capable of, of uh, adopting uh, proposed findings, in fact, and conclusions of law. It's not uh, uh, elective, it's, it's mandatory. This is a, what they call a remand from the court. But the court didn't say, you know, you did anything wrong. The court didn't say, please do it our way. What the court said is, we want to see in black and white the reasoning uh, for your decision not to uh, rezone these lots. Um, as to the mootness issue, um, the applicants uh, can address that if they wish, but we assume that although there's been a change of the ordinances in the town regarding resource protection of wetlands, um, that I assume their position is that they have um, a uh, pending uh, uh, application that has gone through certain processes and that uh, they may benefit by uh, a favorable ruling by the court in one respect or another. There are various aspects and counts to their uh, complaint. Um, I think the gentleman raised another issue as to whether or not the court had sufficient information. Um, while it's the burden of the applicant making an appeal to Spirit Court to provide that record, I think the court had enough information. They wanted to know precisely what you found and what your conclusions were. So I will, uh, I know Ms. Uh, Peggy McGee is here uh, on behalf of uh, the plumbers. Uh, I'm here as well as Mike Hill, who's been uh, in regard to litigation, primarily responsible day to day with the litigation in Superior Court. Um, any of us here to answer any questions? Um, again, we reviewed this with counsel beforehand and agreed this would not be a rehashing of the issues, so to speak, but rather a time for you to, uh, if you will, consider it as you would after a public hearing when you can deliberate and decide. Um, the decision would be uh, motions to adopt uh, a set of uh, proposed findings of fact and conclusions of law. So that's, again, if you have any questions or anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll address them. Um, again, they, Ms. McGee may want to uh, address you as well. Okay, then what I'll first ask the council, basically you've received both of these findings of facts and conclusions. Have you read them and do you understand their, the arguments they're supporting? Everyone involved. Do any of you have any questions of either attorney? Okay, I just had one little change that I might want to make, which is on page three, the conclusions of law. Um, more or less for clarification, since we have passed into the comprehensive plan, if it would be all right if we insert it under comprehensive plan of Cape Elizabeth, have it state the one of 1980. The previous well, one. Well, it, it certainly would. Again, these are, are your conclusions. That was the applicable comprehensive plan okay. at the time of your decision. So that would be uh, certainly a matter of clarification, and uh, I, I certainly find that would be appropriate. Okay. 
Are there any other comments from, or questions from counselors? If not, I'll take a motion on this item. Madam Chair, I would move that we uh, adopt the findings of fact as set before us with, with regard to the plumber decision. Which one? As set forward by. Which one? As set forward we by. We have two sets. We have two sets. Well, as set forth by, they're not really, how can I distinguish them? This, the one that was the one uh, proposed by our town attorney starts proposed findings of facts and conclusions. Right, that is the, the one. one. That's the one you're referring to? Yes. Just, just so that there's no, uh, because there are two and they both begin the very same. <clears throat> the one presented by Council of the Town has first paragraph, F.S. Plumber Co. Inc. is the owner of Lot 27. It's an eight-page one. The say other one has one. multiple exhibits, one. Okay. and in the title says submitted by F.S. Plumber um, Co. Inc. But I think, okay. again, this case has been long enough. Let's make sure we, you, you all know which yes. one you're which addressing. One when and you're, it's when unusual you're to have two submitted as well. To, Un it's also unusual to have yes, two. Yes, for you in your process. To yes, have yes. both. Not um, necessarily in other cases, but for, for the for us, yes. council it is. Councilor Creelman, do you want to make a formal motion? Yes, I would uh, move that the town council adopt the findings of fact <coughs> as proposed by the following, uh, entitled Proposed Findings of Fact and Conclusions uh, of Law Regarding Zone Change Request of F.S. Plummer, Incorporated et al., uh, describing an eight-page document beginning uh, paragraph one, F.S. Plummer Company, Incorporated as the owner of Lot 27 to distinguish it from the other proposed findings of fact. Is there a second? Second. Okay, any questions? I do have one just for extra verification. Um, all of us were on the town council at the point when we made our initial determination. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure that our new member, Councillor Reed, had had the opportunity to read all of the reports from the planning board, the minutes of our meeting, and all the information submitted. Yes, Madam Chairman, I have. And they're clear enough in your mind? Uh, yes, I'm clear. Okay, thank you. If there is no discussion, then I'll take all those in favor of approving these finding effects. It's a 6-0.